right, welcome along to the RT Soccer Podcast. Raf Giallo here. Today I'm joined by Connor Neville of RT Sport Online, former UCD Shamrock Rovers and Sheffield Wednesday midfielder Paul Corey, and Longford Town legend and ex Dundalk manager Vinnie Perth. Um, welcome along, everyone. And uh, Connor, I think you confirmed to me there. I was going to ask if you had actually made it down to the Carlisle Grounds on Friday, um, but it yeah. seems you actually did. It was a. I saw Kerry FC's historic first goal in the League of Ireland. So that was. Uh, I was. I was down there with a Kerry. Uh, a Kerry man who was very intrigued to see them uh, living up in Dublin, and uh, yeah, it was. Uh, they were. <laughs> it's going to be a tough season for them, but it's about consolidation, and at least they got. A, they got on the score sheet. Leo Gaxa, uh, a Kerry man of, uh, I believe, is of Albanian extraction, but he is a Kerry man, and uh, he slipped home their first goal shortly after the hour mark. And, but otherwise, you know, they, they they struggled badly from set pieces and, you know, they, they have work to do, but, you know, a good atmosphere and a good crowd from Kerry. Good stuff. We'll talk more about the first division a little bit later on. But first, it's the Premier Division, second round of action in this season's SSE or Tricity League. And uh, in terms of results on Friday night, Sligo Rovers won 3-2 at UCD. Max Batten with a hat-trick, two of those coming from the penalty spot. Sligo having to come from behind twice. Bohemians beat Dundalk 2-1, so Dundalk still um, winless uh, in the league, whereas Bowes are currently table toppers after two rounds of action. Derry City uh, got up and running now, a 2-0 win against Cork City, who are also looking for their first points. Broader United won, Shamrock Rovers won, Shamrock Rovers uh, down to nine men uh, in that game. We'll talk about that one as well. And then St. Pat's beat Shelburne 1-0 with Owen Doyle scoring. But let's start with uh, Bowes and Dundalk. There's a lot to talk about in terms of Dundalk off the pitch, um, as well as what happened on it. But uh, Paul, I know you were watching this game and uh, Bowes are looking good after two rounds of action. Really good, Raf, and I'm sure Declan Devine is absolutely thrilled with how, how they've started. I heard him after the court game and saying that, you know, they were just very focused on getting their first three points on the board and they managed to do that down in Cork and I'm sure his next maybe step on the ladder was getting the home fans behind them, getting a positive result in daily events and looking to kick on from there. And to be honest, I, th- I thought they were excellent. You, you can really see Declan's sort of imprint on the team with how they set up, particularly when they haven't got the ball. Uh, I think they're chasing and hiring teams much better than they did last year. That starts with the likes of Afal Abbey, Conley, Coos and McDade, who who made it very difficult for Dundalk, who were, who were trying to play through the thirds. And then when they got the ball, I thought there was real brightness about their play. Maybe something that was lacking last year in particular was it was a bit of bite and a bit of aggression. And they seem to have that back. And it was it was really positive signs. I thought, you know, Flores's goal was was naturally enough a standout. It was it was an absolute superb strike. He only seems to score worldies, but the second goal was just very well worked down the left hand side from Rafael Abbey. He managed to get his head up and pick out McDade. And I thought his first touch was excellent to set him up on his left, and then a great strike uh, into the bottom corner. But as nights go, it was it was rocking and daily man. You could tell the atmosphere and the home fans are back. Um, I'm sure there was a lot of frustration there last year at Daily Mount um, I think understandably so but I think there's probably an acceptance that they lost so many players that it was going to take a bit of a rebuild and the opening signs from the first two weeks Raph, is, is they seem to have got a lot of things right they're probably still a, one or two players short but I think the, the kind of the core group that Declan has there combined with the good work that they've done off the pitch it certainly seems like they're back on track and from a Dundalk point of view Vinny um, obviously it's a slow start possibly too early to read into it. But uh, from what you've seen of them so far, what seems to be the issue? Obviously, they drew um, the opening the opening game against UCD and then, you know, looking to bounce back, but didn't quite do it uh, at Bowes. And looking at the highlights, it seemed to be all Bowes as well in that game. Yeah, I think um, it's a tale of, of of two clubs. I think there's a, there's, there's a lot of teams now who are signing players very late into pre-season and really... When you look at the results in the first two weekends, a lot of teams have really struggled. But um, just on Paul's point, I, I mean, I, I've been really impressed with both. Um, I did predict them to be the ones who probably go, uh, push Pats all the way to that sort of third position when it comes to Europe. And um, when you look at the energy, uh, Paul spoke about Adam McDonald from Sligo. I'm not sure why others haven't gone after him. He gives that team a huge lift and obviously Dylan Conley really quick. So, um, and, and there's also, um, as much as people sort of sneered at balls at the back end of last year, there was a little, you know, there was some stuff going on in the media in terms of who the next manager was, who wasn't, but they seem to have got their business done early. Um, albeit like all teams, they've signed a couple of players laid on in the window, but got a lot of good business done early. Declan McDade, 
this someone tried to sign myself actually at Dundalk, but a lot of the structurally they look like that team is, is really set where Dundalk have signed three or four players in the last sort of couple of weeks. Um it's been a little bit erratic from them because obviously there's there seems to be some sort of problems above Stephen O'Donnell's level. Uh, because Stephen's an outstanding coach and he just needs a settled group of players and squad to work with. And they're nowhere near that at the moment. Um, they, they seem to be way off. John Mountney, Robbie Benson hasn't necessarily worked out for him going back, picking up injuries. And uh, um, Daniel Kelly is still injured. So some of their experienced players are way off. It's sort of finding their feet with some of the players that are signing on loan and signing late in the window. And the problem with that is, yes, you can get lucky and some of those players can be really good. But there's too many players sort of finding their feet that don't really know the league and the way in Daily Mountain, a really good atmosphere, a uh, great sort of League of Ireland night. You, you sort of you struggle in that intensity until, un, until you're used to it. And um, they've really been uh, disappointing. And I think um, a lot of that sort of has to go down to what's gone up on around the board level as opposed to um, the management team there. I think they've been probably let down a little bit. We we saw that flurry of signings. I mean, is there, it's a long enough off-season. I mean, why why is it only happening now? I mean, we saw flurry them after the first game and then they just flood in. I mean, surely yeah. this could have been... I think it's a problem for League of Ireland clubs. Um, we've seen... The, um, you don't like to be negative here. here or, or the, the league has gone through a really growth in terms of attendance, in terms of yeah. atmosphere, in terms of... Um, really captured the imagination of the public in a lot of cases. Lots of sold out games, lots of people really passionate about it. But we're u- losing a huge amount of talent to League One and League Two um, out of our league. There's probably a squad that have left their league that would not, but up until four or five years, it wouldn't have really went away. We always had some exceptions, Paul being one example, or Gary Dicker, or people like that would always go away. But now it's like people are leaving Drogheda and jumping. So uh, James Brown, Calvin Phillips um, went straight to Crystal Palace, went straight to Blackburn. So we're, we're losing a lot of talent and we've got young players who managers probably don't feel are ready. So we're relying on the English market or, um, in, or, or maybe Latvia, Estonia um, for players on available and loan or late deals. And unfortunately, you in some cases in November when our season's ending, that's when a manager in a stable club will go, like Stephen Bradley's probably planning his season and his signings in October, November. So he has a good idea at that stage. But the others like Dundalk and, and, and some other clubs aren't in that luxury position because there isn't the strength and the depth in our league at the moment that we have to go elsewhere. And when you go elsewhere, um, things can change so quickly in football. You're not going to get a guy commit to you in November when the transfer window, in, for example, if, um, if he's in the UK, transfer window opens in January, he's still got eight weeks where he could be looking at different bits and pieces. So it's down to transfer window. And I think it's this is probably the first year I've really noticed the effect in how teams have started. Um, they seems to be not at the rhythm. Uh, preseason was a real struggle for a lot of teams. And and um, we look at, say, Derry even brought Oli McNeil in from Fulham late in the window. And he looks a good player, but that was, that, you wouldn't have a lot of time as uh, Rory wouldn't have a lot of time to work with him and integrate him into how to style the play. And it's affecting, I think, team style of play at the moment. Yeah, which I think brings us uh, to the issue of investment, which is the other side of the Dundalk coin, other than what's happening on the pitch. So off the pitch, uh, Hull City's owners and the chairman, Al- Akun Ilikali, um, who coincidentally was at the Pat's Shelburne game on Friday night and was sat beside Andrew Doyle of Shells, so potentially looking at investment there. Um, Hull City's owners, and uh, led by him, are linked with, a, with buying a stake in Dundalk, but Dundalk's owners said on Friday in a statement that they are not planning on selling, but the stu- discussions are ongoing with three prospective parties. And a huge part of this as well is to do with the improvement of the Oriel Park facilities, which is a key part of it. And uh, if we read parts of the Dundalk statement, we need to be honest about our limitations. We will need partners if we wish to achieve our goal of maintaining a strong team on the pitch while simultaneously modernising Oriel Park. In the past 15 months, we've been approached by 10 serious individuals or groups who want to explore the possibility of investing in the club. And then the statement goes on to say, despite the report stating otherwise, we remain in talks with three different groups. 
these discussions include all scenarios, investment, shareholding and ownership. Absolutely nothing has been agreed or finalised. What do you make of it? Um, I suppose to the naked eye, I, I don't have loads of insight into it. Um, it's a little bit confusing. The new owners took over and a fanfare 12, 13 months ago, um, the previous owners left um, a sizable amount of money and within 12 months, um, the squad hasn't been strengthened in any way, shape or form. To, to be fair to the previous owners, they had got a couple of other people interested in the club and they gave it to they, they gave the club back to local owners. They felt that the club was, was going to go in the right direction and uh, within 12, 13 months, they're looking for investors. So it doesn't sound like it doesn't sound great news but hopefully they can get the right people in who because it's such a historic club for league of Ireland uh, reasons and i think Stephen needs a hand there to get that team back into europe again they've got europe this year but i mean qualifying through the league and they look a little bit short at the moment on the pitch and hopefully it resolves itself but releasing statements on the day of a game is not good for any manager and uh, that would have been a difficult day for them heading into that bowls game uh, and actually just on that as well, as you say, it's difficult for a manager when there's things going on, you know, above you, like with the peak six situ- situation, obviously they came in before you took charge as manager. Um, how challenging was that during your period in charge yeah. with a lot of that movement happening behind you? Yeah, no, it's, um, you know, it's really, really difficult. Um, I suppose there was a huge amount of leaks coming out and um, some true and some off the chart stuff and, um, it's difficult because, the, especially the world we live in, um, players would have seen the statement from the club on their phones, travelling to the game, having their pre-match meal. It's a, I always say, no matter what, what environment you work in, whether it's whether it's football, whether it's the business world, nobody does their best work under a cloud. And um, when you're under a cloud and a huge amount of noise going on and people asking questions and protests and rumour mill and people uh, having to release statements and back and forth it doesn't go down well and people say well why can't players just concentrate on football but it doesn't happen and um, it eats away at the morale of, of the group and um, you've only to look at you know the noise that's come out of Manchester United now it's really quiet and results of, are reflecting on the pitch and um, rising sort of tides lift boats and I think there needs to be some good news around Dundalk over the next week or two because um, it, can, it, it, can, it can get in on people and it can be it can really affect you um, again I make the point nobody nobody in any sector does their best work under a cloud yeah and in terms of the rumour mill elsewhere as well there was uh, the Daily Mail reporting over the weekend as well that the Bournemouth owner Bill Foley who recently bought Bournemouth uh, as recently as last year wants to buy a stake in Dundalk as well he has bought a third of Noriang in French League 1 as well but according to the Irish Independent that one doesn't appear to be a runner so again there's a lot of uh, uncertainty but as I said Akunili Kali the whole city owner was at Richmond Park where he watched St. Pat's beating Shelburne 1-0. Now, the belief is he's uh, he's interested in Shelburne, who are themselves interested in, um, you know, getting investors in. And, uh, Paul, I mean, from the Shell's point of view, I mean, results so far, they probably should have beaten Drotty United on the opening night. I mean, the amount of chances they had, um, not even counting the one that Matthew Smith uh, missed in terms of the open goal, they probably would, should have won that. And they were well in the game against Pats until Owen Doyle scored uh, a late, late goal there. But... They, you know, it's a very young, it's a very young team, and probably looking at it as Damien Duff has intimated at the launch a few weeks ago, they, you know, investment would have been quite handy for them. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I can only imagine that Damien Duff was was wanting to add some some players to the squad because he'd probably brought them on to us, you know, a a certain level last year, and maybe he felt that in order to kind of get up that next rung of the ladder, that it was going to need some new faces and and some fresh blood into that squad, but. That naturally enough requires investment. And you can kind of see it in their performances. I thought they were well set up against Pats. I caught glimpses of the game. Very difficult to break down and frustrated Pats for for a large majority of that game. But you always felt that there wasn't a huge amount going forward. And, and scoring goals seems like it's it's going to be a bit of a challenge for them. Um, there was obviously the miss last week, but they didn't seem to create a huge amount of opportunities in Richmond Park on Friday night. And I'm sure that will frustrate them. But I, I'm sure at the same time, there's probably an acceptance that they might need to bide their time and they might need to be patient and wait for investment to come if that is to happen. I think when you when you flip that around 
and you look at St. Pat's and the investment they've got, Raph, I think they look a stronger outfit than they did last year. I think Tim Clancy's done wonderful work there. He obviously lost a, a number of key players at the beginning of last season, but you can see the advantages of keeping the, like, the core part of the squad together and then adding one or two faces in. And the fact that he's able to bring Owen Doyle off the bench with 15, 20 minutes to go, he's somebody who's always going to have an opportunity of nicking your goal because he's just able to smell where the ball might land in the box. And the, the goal was such a perfect example of that. So for Tim, I'm sure he's absolutely delighted. Um, Derry was by no means an easy fixture. I'm sure he would have been happy to take four points from the opening two games. And it just feels now that they probably have the strength and depth to cover some of their, their key players where maybe last year, if an own Doyle or Chris Forrester got injured, you, you were maybe struggling to, to fill that gap. And to be fair to Pat's, um, and to Jer O'Brien and everybody involved in the squad, they've always given young lads an opportunity as well. Sam Curtis has come in and done well. James O'Bank was obviously another example. I know Lonergan went to UCD, but he hasn't been afraid to play uh, Lonergan up, up top where it may have been easier to play Owen Doyle. So they've got a lovely, a lovely mix there. Picking up points is always going to be important. So I'm sure Tim is absolutely delighted with how they've started. Yeah, and Pats have done Dock next, actually. And then, of course, it's, a, it's the first... Uh... Friday, Monday turnaround of the season, of course, as well. Shells, in that case, they've got bows at uh, Talker Park on Friday, and then they have done Dock away next Monday Monday as well. Um, Vinny, I know you were watching Drada against Shamrock Rovers, so 1-1 draw. It's been a slow enough start for Shamrock Rovers, but also the mitigating circumstances. First game, Pico Lopez gets sent off, and then in this in this game against uh, Indrada, who have been a bit of a bogey team for them uh, based on last season, two players uh, sent off in the final uh, 20 minutes. Yeah, I think it's, um, you, you know, I think there's no doubt in Robert's strength and depth in their squad and the quality they, they have all over the pitch. Um, I suppose if you, you'd won fair, I know John Kenny came in, but you'd if you'd won fair, sort of the outside looking in, you'd say, uh, how good would he be if he got an out now striker who scored goals and, and put chances away? And I think Stephen would be, Stephen Bradley would be disappointed that he probably didn't get a second goal or a third goal even in that game and to be fair to draw they were really dogged and that sort of pitch when you go up there it's not necessarily that small but you get that sense of um uh, tightness about it and wasn't a huge amount of space and uh Robert scored a first goal off of a mistake and while they carved out some chances they never carved out real guilt out chances throughout the game and ultimately the long longest uh, draw had a stead in the game and then the sending offs obviously switched in and uh, draw had a momentum and probably disappointed not to win the game in the end draw would have been because they'd got such a maybe 10 minutes with real sustained pressure and um so it was a it was a real fascinating game it's difficult difficult start for Rovers being away from home while Tala gets really developed um they were good at spells against Sligo last week and good at spells against draw but um you've got to take your chances you've got to score goals and um, but the sending offs um, really, really have hurt them over the last two weeks. I think without them, they would have picked up six points and uh, you're already chasing your tail a little bit. Um, so, yeah, it was a difficult night for them. They're inclined to start slowly. I know they started slowly last year, but do Rovers, I always get the feeling when I watch them that they don't dominate with enough swagger You know, suggested by their quality. You know, There's a lot of resting on possession in games and they don't kill off teams in a way I sometimes think they should. Now, it seems strange to say it about a team who've won three titles in a row, but do they are they dominating the league as thoroughly as they should be, as, as, as Dundalk did, say, in the mid-2010s? Yeah, but um, I, I often people often ask me this, and I use the Liverpool and Man City examples of it um, in terms of over the last number of years, and it's a good way to equate to it. Dundalk, I, I felt, maybe that's just me, but I felt played that sort of Liverpool way, high-intensity, um, fullbacks bombing on and, you know, Dane Massey cross and Sean Gannon score and wouldn't have been, you know, a, a, a strange thing to happen. Michael Duffy flying down the line and et cetera, where Rob was a bit more like Man City and, and um, it's a bit more a pa pass with purpose and both are brilliant ways to play. Um, my preference is sort of the Liverpool way over Man City. It's more exciting, but at the same time, They've got some outstanding footballers and it suits their style. And even, even they've got a way of playing and they stick to it. And you can do that when you're the very best team. Uh, so, but they put Gary O'Neill into the back three the other night. And while technically Gary didn't do an awful lot wrong, just 
um, positional sense. So if you look at Dan Cleary's sending off, uh, Gary was just about five yards ahead of him where centre half would have been in line or closer to line with Dan and put Dan under a little bit of pressure. He made a, a silly tackle and he got booked and sent off as a result of it. And it just, they have a way of playing. It suits them. And you're right, it is a little bit slow. And I would say it probably will go against them in Europe in terms of trying to get wins in the conference because I think you need a bit more speed and a bit more power when it comes to winning the games in Europe. But domestically, they've got some outstanding players. And Neil Ferrugia is someone who, as right wing back, um, if he stays fit, he can give them that explosion of speed and power. But you're right, it's a, it's a really interesting argument of, of uh, the right and wrong way of playing football and how you win a league. But it is, it, it does lend itself to not creating a huge amount of chances, I would say, that style of play. Yeah, I think, Connor, what you're trying to say is Shamrock Rovers should be more like the Leitrim footballers in Allianz League Division 4, just blowing blowing teams yeah. apart uh, along the way. The uh, but anyway, you were determined to crowbar in. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't used the Leitrim reference yet uh, at, the, at the start of this season, so I've got that out of the way now. But actually, for Shamrock Rovers, though, Paul, I mean, they've Derry City next um, at Tallis Stadium, first home game of the season for them. Um, so, you know, if you count in suspensions as well, you know, it's... Uh, it all and the fact as as Vinny said, you know, you're already kind of chasing your tail. It's certainly they're going to be stretched this week, Raf. Um, you know, you think Pico's still going to be out, Lee Grace out, Daniel Cleary out. Vinny mentioned there that Gary O'Neill had to play centre half. Sean Hoare is still injured, so it'll be interesting to see how they're going to make up the numbers in those key positions. Because yes, you can you can get away with playing Gary when you're going to have maybe seventy five percent possession. And you're able to utilize his pass now from the back, but positionally, um, for somebody who has to fill in there, if you're if it's not your natural position, it's going to be very difficult. And the way that Derry maybe pull you into into positions and areas that you don't want to go, they could definitely punish you. Um, but I would be very surprised if if they're pressing the in the panic button out in Tala at the moment. I'm sure they know that things will come good. Um, they just like Vinny mentioned, need to be a bit more clinical in the final third. I think they'll start to find that rhythm that we spoke about. Um, as as the games and weeks go by and when they do that they do have that kind of streakiness to their game where they can go 5, 10, 15 games without being beaten and I'm very much expecting that that will happen at some point this season but maybe maybe not a, a must win game against Derry but I'm sure they'll they'll be thinking and looking at that fixtures as maybe one that they don't lose and yeah. uh, you don't want Derry getting too far ahead of you too soon and with the suspensions that they're going to have to juggle some of the injuries that they currently have at the moment as long as they're still within, you know, reaching distance, which they absolutely will be, I'm sure they'll they'll hit a run of form. And the new signs that they've brought in and the players that are already there will, will start to find their groove. Yeah, well, the key, for- Paul, or the big question is, does they play nearly four years, maybe five years, where mm. always play the back three, almost a box in midfield, and they they all know their jobs. It's it's whether it's Ronald Finn comes in or out of the team, he knows his job. Whoever comes in, Sean Gannon. Um, will will they stick to a back three this week? That would be. I, that's what I was thinking. Me as a coach, yeah, he hasn't. Well, he, if you look at it, he probably hasn't got the personnel to play three at the back this week. So um, yeah, it will be. It'll be very interesting to see who sets up there, what players he uses. He might have to to shuffle a few around to to fill those three centre half positions. My instincts would say he might go with two, just with the limitations that he has with numbers. And by the way, Ralph, sorry, that's fascinating from a sort of uh, a coach's perspective to see someone who's challenged Rovers and we've been against each for years. I always knew what you were doing. doesn't mean you can stop mm. it. But to see it this week and Rory will be wondering and they'll be trying to get bits of information out. And that really adds something to this game this week. It'll be fascinating to see the tactical setup of, of Shamrock Rovers. Yeah, for sure. And uh, also the other game, as I said, uh, Sligo Rovers beat UCD 3-2, but had come, had to come from behind twice. There were a couple of uh, penalties there for Max Matt as well to, to complete his hat-trick. But Paul, just on the, the UCD point of view there, I mean, they got a very good draw against Dundalk on the opening day that probably was unexpected. And then, you know, there were for periods there against Sligo Rovers, you know, they could have easily got a point, maybe a little bit more from it. Um, it. There wouldn't have been a huge amount of expectation around them when the season started. What do you make of them having seen them now over two games? Because they, they can be a little bit unpredictable sometimes, UCD. Well, they are unpredictable. They're particularly unpredictable, Raph, when, when you've lost maybe 
you know, the likes of Kerrigan, Whelan, uh, and so on and so forth. And the players that you come in, you've probably not seen a huge amount of. They've either been playing Leinster Senior League or they've been playing with some of the um, the intervarsity teams. So you're, you're not really too sure what you're coming up against. So to be fair to them, they've been very competitive. I thought they were very unlucky against Sligo the other night because there's, there's absolutely no doubt that that third penalty, that the foul took place outside the box. And... Um, had, had Sligo not been given that opportunity, they might have got away with another point. And you start looking at, at the, the first two results, a draw against Sligo and a draw against Dundalk, and you think we take that and we'll build upon it. It's going to be a very difficult season. Um, the way I look at UCD, it tends to come in phases. You, you get a crop that comes in, you, you work with them for two, two and a half years, and then naturally enough, they move on. And then the new crop come in, very inexperienced, very raw, and it's very difficult to get results. And that's kind of where I see them this year, I, I think it, it they'll have some good results and then they'll have some some very poor results. But as the first two weeks go, I think they've shown that they could be competitive against against sides. And Belfield is a difficult place to go this time of year. And I mean that in the sense that a lot of rugby is played on that pitch and it's bobbly, it's dry, it's, it's difficult for, I'm sure, John Russell and Sligo and the teams to come where they want to play with a bit of zip and tempo in their game. It can actually slow you down and it, it, can, it can just be frustrating to play on. And that's I mean, the UCD first goal is probably a good example of that because they've nicked it when it's gone back to the keeper and side will probably make mistakes that they wouldn't do in another pitch. But it'll be a hard season. They'll they'll be right down there. I'm sure they're probably accepting of that. Um, development of the players is is always kind of front of mind for UCD. And if they could kind of bring some of those players on while picking up results, I think that would be very positive for them. Yeah, and uh, turning attention to the first division, Athlone Town got their second win of the season, beating Finn Harps 3-1. So Finn Harps, uh, two defeats in a row to start the season as well. Bray Wanderers uh, beating Kerry FC 3-1 with Connor Neville in the crowd as well. We'll get more of your thoughts on that in a second, Connor. And Cove Ramblers, again, uh, winning again, uh, beating Wexford 2-1. Uh, Galway United, second win of the season, beating Treaty United 1-0. And then Waterford held uh, by Longford Town, one all draw there. But uh, Connor, uh, so for Longford, should I point out there? We, you know, feared the worst after the opening, uh, the opening game of the season, and Sam Verdon abruptly leaving, and you know the, the the vibes there weren't good. But that's a good result getting a draw down in a definite one yeah, against, against the promotion favourites. The, the promotion favourites, yeah, indeed. But uh, you weren't there, obviously. You were at a uh, Bray against Kerry, as you said at the at, at the top. Uh, in terms of like the the Kerry fan base that was there, other than the Kerry man who you were in, whose company you were in, like what was the what was the atmosphere like, and where were you kind of? sat in the Carlisle grounds we were in the coldest place in the world famously I mean you know and it it, it, it actually wasn't too bad and I we were braced for it obviously um, I've been in the Carlisle grounds a couple of times and I was struck by the enthusiasm now it is the first game of the season but both sides seem to be packed I mean the brave fans were in the stand opposite uh, the covered section and we were in the open air opposite in front um, of the press box in front of the press box and there was a decent Kerry contingent I have to say now I don't know whether they all came up from Kerry but uh you know I was you know the, the players came up to them at the end possibly some of them know them I was I was very struck by the the uh the enthusiasm for it and apparently their their game against Treaty is sold out next week as well so it's very hard to get a ticket for Mount Hawk Park now the ground I think only holds 1150 but uh, clearly there's, there's, there's great enthusiasm for League of Ireland football down in Kerry now. It's a bit of a novelty as it stands. So maybe when that wears off, I don't know, will that be sustained? I mean, but yeah, the team is largely, a lot of them have Kerry links, you know, players from down there. Um, the goalkeeper is Austin Stack's keeper. There's a few Gaelic football converts. One of the a sub is Mars Fitzgerald's nephew, um, Roman Tehan, I believe. So they... Uh, they were on the pitch. They were quiet. They were decent enough going forward. I thought they were glaringly open at the back and they conceded two goals from set pieces and could have conceded more. So they have serious issues there and, and Bray could have scored more goals than they did, I thought. You know, but 3-1, 3-1 barely reflected their, their dominance up there. But uh, yeah, it was, it was a good night. And the last time I was in the Carlisle grounds wasn't, and they were in the Premier Division at this point, there wasn't half the crowd there. So... A fair amount of enthusiasm. At one point, there was a, a strange interlude where we heard a woman uh, chanting one, two, three over the tannoy. Apparently, an aerobics class from next door was picked out and went out <laughs> over the tannoy at the Carlisle grounds. I don't know if you want to 
It, it, uh, we weren't sure what it was at the time, but discovered subsequently on Twitter. So uh, the, the Bray uh, Ultras in there started chanting one, two, three in accordance with this this woman next door. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, Vinny, uh, just off, off of that now and moving on from aerobics class and all that, Longford Town, is, uh, as Connor said, you know, they probably would have been fearing the worst going to Waterford after a setback against Athlone on the on the opening day. And then also, as you said there, uh, the captain, Sam Verdon, um, contract being cancelled on the eve of the game and also obviously a lot of change in the squad as well a number of players uh, following James Keddy uh, the former assistant all the way to Wexford but what have you what, like what do you make of the situation there in Longford at the moment at the start of this season yeah i think it's typical of a lot of clubs in, in league of Ireland in terms of longford probably need to to a bit more investment and but it might be one of them seasons where they just have to consolidate and if they sneak into a playoff position probably won't this year with the strength of the first division but just to consolidate and rebuild and uh, find their feet again with, with young players. I mean, the advantage of, of Longford and it's historical is that they get a lot of people, a lot of players that probably aren't good enough to break through, let's say Pats or, or Rovers, and uh, they'll train and sort of uh, halfway, if that makes sense, or um, maybe even a minute and it's on the way to Longford. So they, they'll mix and match. And it is a good breeding ground along for the pitch, by and large, is very good. The stadium is decent and they, they've spent a lot of money and it's it, they, they do a lot of good work down there. But it's probably a good breeding ground now for um, a lot of players to develop. And I think this will be a development season for them. Um, and I think the finances is, is as good as it could be. And uh, but to go down to Ward from pick up a point will give them a huge sort of lift and it'll give them an opportunity of something to build on. And because we Waterford for me are um as good than and, and better than a couple of Premier Division teams. And um they I was at the game against UCD in the playoff and it's one they should have won and they should have got out of that uh, first division. And it's a it's another year for them in that sort of tough environment. But and uh, no, it was really good a good uh, result for Longford Town. They'd love yeah. for train in Ashburn or Leak Slip or somewhere in your time. Leak Slip, yeah, Leak yeah. Slip. When I was there, we always in around that sort of Leak Slip area. Mixed and matched a little bit, but generally around the sort of Leak Slip area. Yeah, and uh, as Vinny said there, Paul, I mean, there is a strength in depth. At least, we're, look, we're, the sample size is small. We're looking at the uh, the first couple of rounds of action, but it's interesting. Ian Ryan's Bray, now Ian Ryan's been really impressive at, at Wexford previously, but Ian Ryan's Bray, two wins in a row. Cove Ramblers, obviously, the first game they were playing... Uh, the kind of new arrival in Kerry FC, which maybe factors in, but they've also won a couple of games uh, in a row. And Athlone Town, who struggled badly, like um, uh, um, you know, like Cove last season, also two wins in a row. So it's a, uh, it's pro- as I said, probably too early to tell. But the the shakeup looks interesting already in terms of uh, the comparison to last season. Yeah, I think naturally enough, people will look at, at Waterford and they'll look at Galway, and it's suspect that they'll be the two teams that will be pushing for that automatic spot but you mentioned Ian Ryan and Bray like Ian Ryan did a fantastic job with probably limited resource down at Wexford and good eye for a player and bringing people in and, and progressing them on I suspect that with a bit more experience the likes of Dane Massey even Chris Lyons a really good striker to have leading the line a first division team brought in the likes of Connor Crowley as well from Wexford I think Bray will do well and um, I think they'll be difficult to beat out there and I, I could see them picking up enough points that they could maybe latch on to the likes of Galway and really push up that upper end of the of the league. But <clears throat> Vinny's right, like it's it's quite unpredictable at times in that division. And um, you know, even UCD getting out of it a couple of years ago, probably people wouldn't have suspected when you looked at some of the budgets that were floating around the first division. But it's great to see. I mean it's great to see that alone have have started well the Cove have picked up results as well because you don't want a massive separation between the top and the bottom. So it'll be interesting to see how, how it kind of meanders as the season goes on. I fully suspect that Waterford will be the ones that will go up automatically, just given the players they have and, and the budgets and the resources. They tend to get a, a good influx of players kind of halfway through the season that kind of pushes them on again. But it will be um it'll be an interesting watch. All right, Ralph. I think yeah. it's certainly the most competitive first division in a long, long time. As you said, Waterford, Galway, Bray. And Finn Harps have had a disastrous start, but the, mm. the three of them look really, really strong. And, um, you know, Treaty are always uh, difficult to play down there. That's the most competitive first division I've seen in a long, long time. And, uh, it, it makes for, as I said, first division is always brilliant for breeding ground and we need to develop players and it's a good opportunity for them. 
Yeah, um, the promotion race, uh, as you said, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be well based on what we've seen so far. It's going to be ex- incredibly competitive, probably reflective of the women's uh, national league last season, which of course is rebranded as the women's Premier Division this season. So Jamrock Rover is coming in as uh, the new club, expanding to eleven clubs. I know in two or three years they're talking about adding a second tier as well. Also, uh, the inaugural Women's Prem- President's Cup took place on Saturday as well with that lone town beating Shelburne on penalties. So getting revenge for finishing runners up to them over the cup last season, also in the league, uh, 2-2 draw in the game. But then obviously, as I said, it went to penalties. And then, as I said, Shamrock Rovers is joining the league uh, for this season as well. And they've made a number of huge signings, especially from rival clubs. So uh, this weekend, uh, as it kicks off, 4th of March, uh, it is going to be Shelburne against Cork City, Galway against Wexford, Sligo against uh, Shamrock Rovers, Treaty United against Bowes, um, Athlone Town against P-Mount, and DLR Waves, they're uh, having a bye week this week, and then they're going to kick off uh, the, the following week. But um, also, I spoke to the managers of P-Mount and Shamrock Rovers, James O'Callan and Colley O'Neill, at the launch of the SSE Electricity Leagues a couple of weeks ago, so keep an eye on those on rte.ie slash sport uh, both of those interviews but also Connor um, in terms of the, the women's national team as I said this expansion in terms of the, the domestic game it's coupled with qualification for the World Cup this summer and there was a game against China nil-nil draw uh, last Wednesday in Cadiz and while the game itself maybe wasn't much to write home about given the fact it's a friendly and it's all about development it is more momentum for them another clean sheet for Vera Powell's side yeah, I mean, they, they, I suppose it was about drafting new players in and they've done that um, and, you know, like, gathering more options ahead of the World Cup. Um, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't much of a spectacle now, the game, I have to say, but uh, another another uh, clean sheet. And it's been something they've been very good at. I mean, defensively, the Irish women's team were superb throughout 2022. And it was really what qualified them for the, for the World Cup, I think, because... There were long passages of those, particularly the home game against Finland, where I thought it wasn't really flowing for them. Um, you know, they uh, they were struggling going forward. They weren't able to create chances. Passing was a bit uneven, I thought. But their defence held, as it did in Hampden Park later on. And that's that's really what they've built their uh, their team on. And it's it's it, sh- it should be, uh, it, it'll be a great asset to them when they're coming up against the likes of Australia and Canada, very strong teams in the World Cup. Yeah, and uh, they've got the United States in April, two games against the world number one side. So, Interesting test. Yeah, yeah that's mm-hmm. going to be yeah a huge test for them. Also, they've got Zambia, and then the send-off game at Tala um, in July is going to be against France as well. So that's going to be uh, kind of a diverse kind of range of different types of opposition this year building into the World Cup, which is exactly what you need. But... Uh, We've also we're also going to talk about the Carabao Cup final. Of course, happened uh, yesterday. In Manchester United ending a relatively long trophy drought, uh, beating Newcastle, who have <laughs> been on a much longer trophy drought, going all the way back to 1969. Um, obviously, a victory for Newcastle probably wouldn't have been a fairy tale given the nature of how they've risen with their with their new ownership. But for their fans, you know, they won't care about that. But uh, Vinny, uh, from what you've seen at a, seen at that game uh, yesterday at Wembley. Uh, I mean, it's probably symbolic, the fact that Casemiro has probably been the best signing um, from last summer. He got one of the goals, but also um, Marcus Rashford, who had the goal taken away from him, and it was given uh, as an OG, OG to uh, Sven Bottom. And it's symbolic that those two probably were the difference in a in a game where it's kind of signalling that Manchester United are coming back. Yeah, I think um, this 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 has been really impressive um, by Ten Hag because... We've seen false dawns at Manchester United, like Van Gaal won the trophy, Mourinho won the trophy, and Solskjaer got that team back to second. And uh, But this feels a little bit different, and it feels like there's good sort of vibes around the club, and it feels like there's momentum. Now, um, the only note of caution on that is the final step in any league um, is, is the most difficult one, and taking them from where they are to actually winning a league title um, is really ultimately where they want to get back to is huge, and uh, but real good signs. Um, I, I thought it that was a really difficult watch yesterday. I didn't really overly enjoy the cup final. Um, the you know very stereotypical Dutch manager. He brought on two defensive midfielders with 15 minutes to go, turn it up, and said, "Now we're done here. This is enough." And but at the same time, yes, I think Casemiro's signing has been outstanding, and Rashford's form is is 
you know, he's getting back to world class. I think that's been coming for a long time. I'm sure Southgate's what scratching his head going, uh, why didn't I use him more at the World Cup? Because I felt that form was coming just before the World Cup as well. But um, I thought for Ran, a centre half, I think it's not that he goes under the radar. I think people forget how good of a footballer he is. And defensively, you've got to be sound. And um, he's formed a brilliant partnership there and, and uh, at the back. And that's really what they, they built that on. Um, but as I said, it's the next step now is crucial for Manchester United. But very, very impressive. This manager looks the real deal. Um, albeit is, um, he's got to he's got to make that final step. As I said, yeah. And uh, I think uh, in happier news, Varane has retired from international duty just in time uh, before facing Ireland next month. So uh, that's uh, that's good from our point of view. Obviously, the the French death chart um, outside of players like him. Um, probably will still leave us with plenty to worry about. But uh, Paul uh, probably went under the radar a little bit because it was the uh, the game before the cup final. But uh, Chelsea continuing their current sort of barren run, losing uh, at Tottenham. You know, I think the last time I was talking to you about Chelsea was before the World Cup. So a lot has changed there. Obviously, Graham Potter has uh, has been embedded in further, but also they've you know, they probably signed half of Europe and South America and brought them in, uh, brought them into Stamford Bridge. And it's going to take a while to gel a lot of young players. You know, what, if, like in terms of the future and what the plan sort of looks like from the Chelsea ownership, like what do you make of it as someone who watches them quite closely? Uh, very good question. I mean, a, a lot of their dealings in, in the transfer market seems to be very reactionary and there doesn't seem to be a huge amount of planning or structure to to their proceedings. And, you know, if, you know, Arsenal seem to be in for Mudrick, they seem to be in for Mudrick. And, and I'm not really sure that lends itself to to success within within football. But I'm starting to worry for, for Graham Potter, to be honest with you, Ralph. Um, I watched them against Dortmund in the Champions League and I thought they were very good. And I couldn't believe that they didn't get out of that game with, with something um, because they created so many chances. And you thought, OK, Performances are good. Results will start to will start to come, but the the last two performances uh, have have been absolutely dreadful. Southampton was really poor, and yes, against Tottenham was was even worse. A lot of the ball, but absolutely nothing in the final third to to threaten against that Spurs side. And I don't know. I I I probably would have been of the opinion two weeks ago whereby they'll stick by Potter and and they'll give him time and they'll maybe give him to the beginning of next season. But it has a worrying feel whereby. The fans seem to have turned on Potter. You, you see some really horrible kind of headlines in, in the papers about some of the threats that he's been receiving. And I thought on the weekend, it looked as if a couple of the players maybe given up a bit. Um, you know, that kind of body language where players aren't running as hard as they as they have done previously. And that doesn't look good. And um, if if results don't come, I think the next two games will be vitally important. I think they play Leeds in the weekend and then the second round of the Champions League. If they're both to be bad results... I would not at all be surprised if if they were to to chop it and changes. The likes of Arteta might help him, whereby he went through a really bad run at Arsenal. They stuck by him. They can kind of see the fruits of of being loyal to a manager. But just the history of Chelsea, the fans have a demand to be competing and at least winning games. And when that's not happening, they can turn very quickly. And ultimately, the manager tends to be the one that loses out. And all the all the kind of pointers are are looking like it's it's going to fall on Graham Potter's shoulders, and he's not the only one responsible. But you know, managers typically are the ones who who pay first, and if something doesn't change soon, you could absolutely see a change happening there. But before we go, um, Vinny, in terms of John O'Shea's appointment to Stephen Kenny's staff, so this was a position on uh, the Ireland senior staff, which had been previously filled by Damien Duff, then Anthony Barry, then John Eustace, all departed uh, in different circumstances, but. Uh, O'Shea had been working with Jim Crawford in the under 21s uh, to good effect by all accounts as well obviously they'd had a really good campaign unlucky not to qualify for a European Championship but uh, what you make of that uh, that appointment and that move to promote him up from the 21s to the seniors um, yeah I, I, to be honest I, I sort of don't know where where that, where I stand on that one I'm not sure where it comes from because John John has been around and he's been on his coach and sort of with the FEI between his pro license and uh, so he's been around for the last two years and they haven't gone to him but, and now they have so um, I'm, not, I'm not too sure and um, obviously he's a huge name and he'll get the respect of the players when he walks in uh, that bit is that's the easy bit but um, it, it, it's just hard to know we're sort of 
Um, we've been unlucky in terms of so many people that we've hired have, have gone on and moved on to, in their eyes, bigger and better things. So um, what we need is someone to stay there for the, the duration of the campaign and, and build relationships with players. And um, particularly someone who's been a player and a coach, you really like them assistance roles to be good people, people you can get on with, people that you build a relationship with. You can fall in and out with managers, but I think the role of the assistant manager or the, the first team coach is huge. And by all accounts, John is just a brilliant person. So I think that will help him. But, um, you know, we have such a difficult um, campaign ahead of us that, um, yeah, it's 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 one that I, I, I certainly didn't see that one coming at all. Um, it was a bit of a shock to me. Yeah, um, he has been working with Stoke, I think, which was one of the kind of reasonings that they, you know, with, the, with all the other coaches, for, for the most part, they've been sort of working with club sides. And I think there's a sense from Stephen Kelly that he wants people who are sort of working at club level and then bringing kind of ideas back as well. But um, it's, yeah, it's an it's an interesting move. And I suppose, um, Connor, I mean, we talked about Anthony Barry, it's nearly a couple of years, well, just after he left um, and went to join Belgium, and then he's since gone on to the Portugal job. But he was kind of he was crucial uh, in a period where results actually were being picked up. Yeah, but he was credited with Ireland's um, shift to the current formation. I don't know how true that was, but he was certainly credited with it, and he was credited with Ireland's uh, imagine more imaginative set pieces, which produced a goal away to Qatar, I believe. And there was a general uptick in in Ireland's form in the latter half of. 2021 which i'm not sure it was entirely sustained last year's great win over scotland but other results were patchy and a very good performance in ukraine um yeah he was a big loss but i suppose if you're if you're hiring in demand assistant coaches you're you're they're vulnerable to being picked off by someone else so i suppose that's part of the deal in that respect and we we lost anthony barry to belgium and now portugal but uh yeah, I mean, John O'Shea, he, he's a great career. He's obviously, he worked with the under-21s for two years, so presumably he, he knows what he was doing. The under-21s had a pretty good campaign. I mean, it went very unfortunate not to qualify in the end. So hopefully he, he'll step up to the mark. Uh, yeah, I mean, they, to, to, to a degree, I mean, this campaign is a bit of a shot to nothing, I feel. The, the group is so horrendous that it's unrealistic almost to anticipate we could come second in it. I mean, I think, you know, we should be, if we, if we, if we come third while uh, performing well, that should, you know, I presume that will be seen in context and there, there may be another chance to qualify down the line of the nation's league. I mean, I, we'd have to look into the permutations of that. I mean, the nation's league, it seems to be an endless safety net there. So I, you know, I, it, the, the group to some degree is a shot to nothing, although, coming forth would probably per be perceived as regression and that that might leave the manager under more pressure again you know yeah we'll see anyway the the squad should be named in the uh, in about in a couple of weeks and then of course the France game is on the 27th but we're playing uh, Latvia before that as well so uh, there's uh, there's a little bit of time to build towards and obviously there's players to, to keep an eye on the likes of Evan Ferguson of course and um, whether Joe Hodge uh, gets back into action with Wolves and also in terms of uh, some of the kind of centre back options as well like Nathan Collins who seems to have uh, not well he doesn't seem to be getting much game time now since Craig Dawson went in or uh, were signed by Wolves in January but anyway that's all uh, to come in the next few weeks but uh, Paul Carey and Vinnie Perth thanks a million for coming on this week thank you thanks Ralph uh, and Connor Neville uh, I don't know which uh, League of Ireland ground you're heading to next but uh, hopefully there's no like aerobic classes or anything happening uh, nearby next time you might take up aerobics since uh, I know <laughs> <laughs> all right uh, the podcast will be back next week <laughs>